Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, anyone to confirm if I'm audible? Am I audible? All right, thank you. Uh, welcome to microeconomics. Uh, where we are dealing with the subject of economics, but on a micro level. So now looking at microeconomics, we are looking at economics from an individual perspective within an economy. So we understand that the word economy simply reflects a system of interrelated um, participants within an economy or a system of interdependence within an economy. So for there to be interdependence, we need to be having various participants or role players within a particular market, which then creates uh, uh, an interdependence within which we refer as an economy so in a simple economy they are and the households these are the two uh, within such an economy so in terms of the households you find out that the households are the factors of uh, the owners of the factors of production and by factors of production we're simply referring to elements that are required in order for productive capacities to take place and these includes elements like labor capital uh, entrepreneurship um, um, uh, and natural resources. So all of these elements need to be combined by the firms, the firms which take advantage of these uh, factors of production in order for them to produce goods and services which are required by the households. So you find out that as they uh, interrelate amongst each other, as they try to um uh interdependent on each other the firms would come to the households to get the factors of production from the households they get the natural resources from the households and as they are doing so they are doing so in a market which gets created simultaneously which you refer to as the factor market the factor market this simply refers to the market in which factors of production can be acquired uh and uh for this module we're also going to be looking at what we refer to as that factor market as a topic on its own to try to see what we are looking at in terms of uh, the factor market. Then as these firms would have collected these natural resources, they then provide these natural resources to the households in what is referred to as uh, the goods market. They then provide them in form of goods and services in the goods market. So in the goods market, this is where firms provide goods and services which are required by the households in order for them to meet their uh, needs and wants which needs to be satisfied which you understand in the subject of economics that they are unlimited all right so this interdependence amongst these participants or role players within such a market would create what we refer to as an economy so basically this simply highlights the phenomenon that we refer to as an economy so this particular economy for it to function very well again you'd find out that there are certain activities that cannot be met as a result of firms and households uh, interrelating on their own. For instance, uh, we understand that firms are profit oriented. Firms, their main goal is to maximize on profit. So since firms main goal is to maximize on, on profit, you'd find out that they ignore certain elements which might be costly to them, which are not in line with profitability, for instance, the provision of what we refer to as public goods and services, these public goods and services, which might not be profitable in nature, which might be difficult to assign uh, any profitability in them. And for example, we're talking about public roads, public infrastructure that is used, the provision of healthcare services, the provision of uh, the, uh, the national security, the provision of a legislature within uh, an economy which provides property rights, um, uh, that people have to adhere to in order for an economy to function smoothly. So you'd find out that these are elements that the private firms could not or cannot provide because uh, 
uh, as well as uh, for them to be able to provide them at a price which uh, would then become profitable. So that's where the government comes into play. So now when you're talking about the uh, government in an economy, we're now talking about economic systems. So you find out that in an economy without uh, the government intervention, we refer to that as a free market economy. A free market economy simply refers to an economy uh, where the forces of demand and supply uh, would be there to determine what is to be produced, how much is to be produced, and for whom it is supposed to be produced. So you find out that when the government now comes into play, it tries to regulate or to provide a rationale uh, in terms of how much is to be produced, for whom is it to, uh, to be produced, as well as answering some basic questions that cannot be answered by the private firms in the households when they are operating on their own. So the government comes into play by providing the public goods and services and for them to be able to do so, they need to have revenue and the revenue comes from, you see that there are arrows here that are indicating taxation uh, to the government and in such a way also the government would also be employing individuals that are coming from the factor market. This is where you see, this is where you see the labor coming from uh, the factor market and they also consume certain goods and services that also come from the goods market. So you'd find out that these elements, as they interrelate amongst each other, they create what we refer to as an economy. And we're going to be looking at um, uh, uh, the markets, the goods market, what happens in the goods market in terms of demand and supply, what happens in the factor market in terms of demand and supply in the factor market, what also happens when we're talking about economic systems, where we are talking about economic systems without the government intervention, economic system with the government intervention, economic systems that are mainly controlled by the government, and we try to come up with uh, conclusions in relation to uh, those different um, spectrums within such an economy. So this particular diagram that you see on your screen is what is referred to as a secular flow of income and spending within an economy, and it basically highlights these elements that we are uh, that we are trying to talk about here. So um, this is our starting point in relation to the subject of economics. When you are being introduced to this economics, you have to understand the secular flow of income and spending. Without an understanding of the secular flow of income and spending, you are not understanding anything in regards to the um, subject of economics. But when you understand it, you now understand that everything that you're going to be dealing with emanates from topics that you're going to be looking at in relation to this particular module they emanate again from this secular flow of income and spending we're going to be looking at um uh, i talked about economic systems we're going to be looking at economic systems as a topic basically looking at the, the different types of economic systems that are in existence when you see the firms in the household operating on their own without the government it means that that is a free market uh, system and when we now introduce the government is, is taking the place of the firms at the private firms we're not talking about a command economy so we find out that this secular flow of income and spending is very very important because it highlights all of the successive topics that we're going to be talking about and we're also going to be looking at the elements in relation to the good supply the elements of uh, consu consumer uh, utility, uh, consumer behavior, the households out the behavior, the goods market. We're also going to be looking at the factor markets. Uh, what is it that gets uh, uh, formed within the factor markets, the demand within the factor market, the supply within the factor market, as well as we're going to be looking at the firms, the firms that are in existence within uh, uh, a particular market in what we refer to as the market structures. Uh, what gets formed when there are different types of firms and how they relate in relation to the government, to the households, and we try to uh, come up with uh, conclusions in regards to that. So this is just a highlight of uh, what we're going to be looking at in relation to uh, uh, this particular uh, economy. So just take 
taking us back a little bit we just want to talk about an important uh, topic in the subject of economics which is referred to as the production possibility curve so we have highlighted the notion of firms producing and households are uh, consuming what the firms would have produced. So that means that uh, in any economic system, uh, the firms, in order for them to be in existence, there is need for them to have natural resources or to have factors of production which they then use to produce uh, various goods and services that are required within an economy. So the various goods and services that are produced within an economy are determined by the extent of the factors of production available, which we refer to as the within an economy. So resources if combined to get produced Uh, pardon me, uh, allow me to reconnect. My network is just uh, hit a bit, and I'll be joining again in, in, a, in a minute. Right, uh, it took it skipped a bit. All right, uh Okay, so I had introduced the production possibility frontier. Uh, and what you have on your screens, let me just see if it is visible. Okay, I think it's visible now. Is an example of what you refer to as a production possibility frontier. So a production possibility frontier highlights a maximum of two goods that can be produced within an economy. If uh, all the resources are taken into advantage. So it's basically saying that taking advantage of all the resources within this particular economy, we can produce a combination of two goods. In this aspect, we are talking about potatoes and fish. So if you are maximizing uh, the production of both goods, you'd find out that we'd be producing along what we refer to as the production possibility frontier curve which is the blue line that you see here running from A to F. So these are the various combinations that you can be producing 
if you are to maximize all of the resources within this particular uh, economy and you're uh, maximizing them for the production of potatoes and for the production of fish. So as you move from point A to point F, you'll be varying in terms of the combination of either potatoes or fish that you're going to be producing if you're maximizing all of the resources that you have available. And one thing that we note in the subject of economics is that resources are scarce. You do not have resources in abundance. You do not have resources in unlimited amounts. So since resources are available in limited amounts, we have to make decisions in regards to what are we going to be producing, what combinations are we going to be producing of, uh, within the amount of resources available and in terms of uh, the, the goods and uh, services that are required within this particular economy. So having starts taking that into account, you'd see that uh, at this particular juncture, within this particular uh, example that you're using, they can either choose to produce at point A here, and at point A here, uh, you can see that there are 100 kgs of potatoes and zero fish, and we've utilized all of the resources that are available within an economy, taking into consideration the natural resources, the capital, the labor, and if you have to maximize that in terms of uh, potato production, uh, we'll be able to produce only 100 kg of uh, potatoes. We would only be able to produce only 100 kgs of potatoes and zero fish. And if you were to devote all of the resources that are available within the economy towards fish production, you'd find out that the only resources, the only uh, production that will be able to take place is five baskets of fish and zero potatoes. But if you'd want to vary uh, to have a little bit of fish, a little bit of potatoes, we can vary in between point B, C, D, E here where at point B you are producing 95 kgs of potatoes and one basket of fish, point C is 85 kgs of potatoes and two baskets of fish, point D it's uh, 70 kgs of potatoes and three baskets of fish and at point E you can see that there's production of 40 um, kgs of uh, potatoes and four baskets of fish. So the decision of where to produce would be determined now by uh, other elements like demand, what is being demanded within the economy, as well as uh, what is uh, deemed to be lucrative in, 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 uh, in terms of um, production within that particular economy. So basically, we are simply saying that if you are producing along the production possibility frontier, you are maximizing all of the available resources that you have available within that particular economy, and therefore you are producing at what you refer to as the efficient uh, efficient regions of the production possibility frontier. So when you're maximizing all the resources, we're basically saying that you are efficient in terms of your uh, productivity. And you'd find out that in some instances, uh, you might choose to produce maybe at point H here inside the production possibility frontier. So any production that takes place inside the production possibility frontier would be devoid of efficiency because we are not fully utilizing all of the available resources or the maximum potential that we have within such an economy. So therefore, this would be feasible, but would not be uh, efficient because we are not fully utilizing the resources. So we'd find out that with the subject of economics, we're also looking to the extent at which we are utilizing the resources that are available within, uh, within an economy and allocating them to the best use uh, within that particular economy. And you'd find out that at point G here, you are not able to produce at point G because it is beyond what the capabilities of your resources is able to achieve within such an economy. And therefore, uh, this would be an unattainable region in regards to the production possibility frontier. So this is an important phenomenon in regards to the subject of economics because it highlights certain aspects that are deemed to be pivotal in regards to the subject of economics. For instance, I talked about scarcity, the scarcity of resources. How does the production possibility frontier highlight scarcity within, uh, within an economy? So if you look at the production possibility frontier, I talked about point G, where you would want to be producing maybe 85, 85 kgs of potatoes and four baskets of fish that particular level of production is not attainable because the resources are scarce in such a way that we cannot uh, afford to produce a simultaneous 
uh, level of 85 kgs of uh, potatoes and four baskets of fish at the same time because of the scarcity of resources. And you'd also see that it highlights the concept of what we refer to as opportunity costs. So opportunity cost in economics refers to the value of the foregone alternative. So you'd find out that uh, when it comes to uh, choices within the subject of economics, you are always having choices of either to produce potatoes or either to produce fish. This is uh, a phenomenon that you always find in many uh, instances other than uh, potatoes and fish. It can either be you um, uh, choosing either to work or to just take off a holiday. These are the choices that you have. So your decision that you are making either of choosing uh, to work or either choosing potatoes uh, uh, as you are sacrificing fish or either, either choosing to work as you are sacrificing leisure or either choosing to have a holiday as you are sacrificing work, that would create on, its own what you refer to as opportunity cost. So opportunity cost simply refers to the value of the foregone alternative. How much have you given up to gain an extra uh, unit of a particular product? So suppose that you're producing at point B, you're producing 95 kgs of potatoes, one basket of fish, and you'd want to move to point C here. How much of potatoes are you going to be giving up for you to gain one, uh, one basket of fish for you to get two baskets of fish? So the value that you've given up is what you refer to as opportunity cost. So from 95 to 85 to, for you to get to two baskets of fish, is the opportunity cost of you getting an extra basket of fish so basically that is in simple terms what you are referring to as opportunity cost and the production possibility front here highlights this concept of opportunity cost as it highlights uh the movements that happens or that occurs along the production possibility front here either from point a to b point b to c d to c uh d to e e to f all of these movements that should be taking place as you are choosing either increasing the production of uh, potatoes or the production of fish, there is an opportunity cost that you're taking place. There's something that you're sacrificing for you to gain an extra unit of a, of a certain particular product. So you'd see that this is a very, very important um, phenomenon when it comes to the subject of, economic, of economics. All right, so having thus highlighted that, we are now able to view come to uh, interpretation of the possibility frontier. So it can be either goods or services, uh, whatever it might be, given the particular scenario given. So what would be important for you uh, to be able to grasp is understanding what a production possibility frontier is, uh, uh, what the movements between these two points A and B would denote, uh, as well as what the points D and C are indicating in regards to the production possibility frontier. All right, so someone is asking a question, what is point H considered an equilibrium? Let me see the point H that you are referring to. Maybe it's in, within... Um... All right, so you're asking about this particular uh, uh, scenario here. And you're saying that why is what is point H considered the equilibrium? Okay, okay, okay. So point H is not the equilibrium. Point H simply refers to a level of production that is taking place at this particular point. And at point H, like I said, like I stated, this is where production is taking place, but it is inefficient because we are not producing along the maximum potential that we have. The maximum potential that we have is denoted along the boundaries of the production possibility frontier. And if you're producing at point H here, this is regarded as an inefficient position because you're not producing uh, using all of the available resources that you have at your disposal. And hence, as a result, you'd find out that uh, the inefficiency brought about here would not necessarily be economic when it comes to us uh, economic, economists because we want to be uh, uh, fully maximizing of all of the available resources within the uh, economy. All right. So given such a scenario, you should be able to interpret these points, point D, point C, point A, and B. 
and be able to come to a conclusion in regards me. So I think for today, I just wanted to highlight that in relation to that particular topic. Then uh, just to have a look at uh, the assignment. There's a particular assignment for those that are from Stadio and for those that are from Mancosa, your assignments would be a little bit different because you're going to get KCQs. Let me just allow me to just look at uh, the Stadio assignment. But you can also look at it because it's one subject. It is economics. All right, let me reshare that. <coughs> All right, so for those from uh, Studio, this is how your assignment was looking like. Um, and they're saying it is due on the 21st of April, 2023. And the first question had multiple choice questions. Second question had true or false questions. The third question is an interesting one because we've just covered this particular topic. So it is very, very interesting for us. And I'm, I'm really, really excited because uh, with the knowledge that I've delivered, I know that all of you are able to answer this uh, particular question without any trouble. So I wanted to look at the multiple choice, but when I saw this, let me just stop here. This is what we, we, we've been doing for the past 20, 30 minutes. All right, so let's just have a look at that. Allow me to just meet someone here. Okay. All right, so we have a production possibility front here on our screen, which is from the current uh, assignment that we are supposed to be ascertaining. And it is showing on the y-axis, which is your vertical axis, product A. And on your x-axis, which is your horizontal axis, uh, product B. Then we have various points that have been labeled, uh, point A, point B, point C. Then we have point X and point Y. Then the first question, 3.1, is saying, define the diagram. What is the diagram that you see uh, on your screen? And I get excited because... Uh, I, I've just been talking about what the diagram is uh, some moments ago. All right, but for the sake of time, let me just get into redefining it again. So basically, this is a production possibility frontier. And by definition, it shows the maximum amount of goods that can be produced within an economy um, if all the resources are fully utilized. So basically, it's showing the maximum potential that an economy is able to achieve if all the resources are fully utilized in terms of the production of product A and product B. So that is just the general definition of a production possibility to frontier. Then 3.2 is stating that indicate what points A, B, C illustrate on the diagram. What do points A, B, C illustrate on the diagram? What do they mean? What value are they showing you? So you can see that points A, B, and C are indicating points where we are fully utilizing our resources or efficient points along the production possibility frontier where we are fully utilizing our resources and they are indicating the variations that can take place as well in regards to the production of product A and B, either increasing the combination of product B at the expense of product A, uh, vice versa. So basically we're talking about Along this uh, boundary, A, B, C, A, B, C, we are fully utilizing our resources there. So therefore, whether we're producing at point A or at point B or at point C, we are fully utilizing our resources and we are producing um, at the uh, uh, boundary of the production possibility frontier, which is the maximum potential. So uh, a, a variation from either point A to point B or point P to point C is what was, I was referring to as uh, it denotes the uh, notion of opportunity cost. All right, so basically that is why you are expected to be talking about a 3.2. That's why it is few marks, only two marks. And indicate what letter X illustrates on the diagram. Letter X is inside the production possibility frontier. What does letter X indicate? I have talked about this when you're talking about letter H. It was letter H previously. Now it's letter X. So it's the same phenomenon. 
So with letter X, it's inside the production possibility frontier. And when we're producing inside the production possibility frontier, we're producing at an inefficient point or inefficient level in regards to the combinations that you're producing. So hence, uh, letter X indicates an inefficient level of production. So this highlights inefficiency here or underutilization of resources because you're not fully utilizing the resources. So you'd have answered 3.3. Then 3.4 is stating indicate what letter Y illustrates. So letter Y is beyond the production possibility frontier. And when a, uh, a combination is beyond the production possibility frontier, we're simply talking about an unattainable level of production because of the limited resources that we have. So basically we're talking about unattainability of the, uh, the, 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 the the particular level so basically letter y is indicating an unattainable level of production all right then 3.5 is talking about differentiate between an indifference curve and the production possibility curve so we haven't talked about indifference curve yet as of yet we're going to be talking about them later on but um they are different so for now, I will not give you the answer for 3.5 because we haven't looked at the indifference curves as yet. But if we had looked at it, I was going to uh, uh, provide the answer for you. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's uh, presentation. So uh, we would want to be conducting uh, classes for economics, microeconomics, and the classes are costing uh, 750 for the whole module which includes um, the assignment as well. So we're going to be looking at the assignment. So hence, it's, it's, it's part of the uh, package. And this 750 can be paid over a period of three months. So that means that uh, you're able to pay 250 each month up until we conclude uh, the module. So basically, I believe if you are within the groups, you have information in regards to that. And if you don't have, you can please highlight so that um, we, we can give you uh, the information in regards to how we're going to be conducting our paid, uh, our paid sessions. So I believe um, you're going to be joining us in our paid sessions as we'll be delving much more deep into the subject of economics. I don't know if you have any questions, uh, anything that you'd want to be clarified before we close this session. All right, so that means all is well and all is clear. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, by the way, I did not introduce myself. My name is Fortune from Varsity Unlimited Tutors. Uh, apologies for that, extreme apologies for that. I think when we started, I just went through the uh, information. So my name is Fortune from Varsity Unlimited Tutors, and I was your uh, tutor today, and I'll be the one that will be uh, uh taking this uh, module for those that are going to be with us up until the, uh, the rest of the module thank you very much until we meet again goodbye